I believe it was William Kavanaugh. He said something like, um, the line between religion and politics was not discovered. It was invented. And that was in the context of him letting me know for the first time that liturgy means work of the people. So like religion, like tradition, like liturgy, um, these are abstractions in some sense. My name is Miguel Iniesta. I've been in the music scene since 2011. I've filmed and photographed it all. House shows, coffee shop shows, venues, and festivals. When I fell in love with theology and filmmaking, I started to feel restless as I tried to divide my theology from my creativity. For whatever reason, I felt as if they needed to be kept separate. Then as I dug deeper into theology, I noticed that I had fewer people around me that thought and lived differently than me. I started to get frustrated, and I began to wonder, how can I unite both my Christian world and my creative world? The answer, music. So in February of 2019, with the help of some of my friends, I threw my first house show in Riverside, California. I invited three local bands and all of my friends. One of those bands was Cherry Domingo. I first saw them perform at a different house show. I instantly loved their music and lyrics. And as I kept booking them for more shows, we became friends. It was then that I realized that for the Christian to live an undivided life between the sacred and the secular, we have to practice radically ordinary hospitality. To help me live this out and further ground me in theology, I began to hang out with the guys over at Humble Beast since they've been doing this for a lot longer than I have. Throwing my own house shows was me trying to apply what Humble Beast has been teaching me and make a resource for the local church to help bridge the gap between theology and creativity. Cherry has existed since 2016, so we're cut. It'll be in you know, this October. It'll be four years. But I mean, individually, I mean, I played with my cousin since we were fucking kids. Because we're yeah. cousins. I played with Adam for like eight years. We played with Simon for like three years. Three yeah, like, like off and on. So I got connected with Anthony. Um, we met uh, quite a few years ago at some like house party. I went with a couple friends, I didn't know who he was, and he was playing guitar and singing and sounded really great. And I was trying to start a band with one of my friends at the time. Me and Adam played in a band. Um, it was like more of a hardcore band and that was my first band. That lasted for like a year, I think, total. Like a year, year and a half total. And then I fucked it up because I fell in love with a girl and I was like, I need to get a real job and stuff. And I sold vacuums. When we first started, um, Anthony didn't even play guitar. He was just our front man. Uh, my friend Matt was the original guitar player, but that had to end and um, we've gone through a few drummers. I'm Simon. I'm the new drummer of Cherry Domingo. Yeah, official drummer? Still not sure yet. Okay. Working shitty jobs made me realize like what I really want to do, which was to play music. So I started writing. 
I hit Adam up, I called him and said I wanted to start a band again and then we just kind of got it going. We decided to start this band and uh, Alex got involved too. We convinced him to play bass. He said, hey Alex, do you want to be the bass player? for this band I'm starting, and, and I said, like, yeah, right, you're not starting a band. <laughs> no, actually, genuinely, Alex did not want to. Yeah, I didn't want to be in the band. Yeah, I told him, I was like, I think band. you can find someone else. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah, really yeah, want to be in a band. I, I honestly was insecure about it. I didn't think I could pull it off. It was my first time being in a band, and I was like, I don't think I'm okay. Because it started off with like just jamming, nothing mm -hmm. serious, and then we were just like making songs with no purpose, mm -hmm. and then stuff started coming out because yeah. of it, and then I was like, wow, this is a, like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. and then we started taking it at like our first live show, I was like, I fell in love. I was like, this is like what I want to do for yeah. sure. So. David told a story that I think gets at how he tends to approach these things. I take the things that move me for some reason and I explain. I guess now I would say I try to bear witness to the witness I perceive in the Kendrick Lamar album or the Coen Brother film, that kind of thing. Thomas Terry, and I am the executive director of Humble Beast. So we've been around for about 10 years. Um, Humble Beast started off as uh, just a, a bunch of dudes who were passionate about creativity and um, passionate about our Christian worldview. And hip hop was the medium in which we would communicate our worldview. Uh, and so Humble Beast really kind of intersected at, at, at that point. Um, we also wanted to help disciple younger cats who uh, were really developing their Christian worldview. And so that's, that's when we started Humble Beast. Uh, so I've been a part of it since the beginning. Uh, started it with just a few cats. Um, so Braille, Brian Winchester, uh, who's also in a group with me called Beautiful Eulogy. Uh, we started the label uh, in 2009 and have been going ever since. My name is Eliezer Reese. I'm a graphic designer in Vancouver, Washington. I serve as the art director at Humble Beast and run my own design studio. I started to get into graphic design when I was about 18 years old. Um, back then I was kind of trying to find out what I was going to do with my life, what I was going to go to college for. My name is Ryan Lister and I work for Humble Beast and at Trinity Church of Portland. Uh, here in Oregon, and my job at Humble Beast is pretty much do a lot of things, but the title itself is Director of Discipleship and Doctrine. But really what that means is a lot of things that I'm, that I'm focusing on with regard to Humble Beast or organization, putting together sort of theological trajectories for conferences and kind of where Humble Beast is going to be going with regards to ministry and discipleship of, of creatives. I was at Western Seminary, still am at Western Seminary teaching, and I was thinking about uh, how Western could actually teach people in the area, people uh, in Portland, and sort of thinking about what their distinctives are. Because I began to realize that people in my classrooms, you know, they looked a lot like me and thought a lot like me. And wanted for me to come in uh, from the perspective of a performer who really prizes theology. As we thought about that class, I really started to think, man, what if we could take some of his unique skill set as a professor who cares about creativity and theology? How could we take some of that and push that into more of my context, which is a whole bunch of performers? I was thinking about, okay, how do, how do I reach people from Portland? How do I reach the creative sphere here? We thought, nah, let's go bigger than that. Let's, let's think about doing a conference, which is just always what I do. I always tend to think about things on, on, on a bigger scale. That's really hard to accomplish, <laughs> but it ended up working out. So we decided we would we would pioneer this Canvas conference where we would invite um, creatives from all over the world to come and we would bring in some professors and some performers and let them kind of, you know, battle this whole 
tension out before the audience. And it actually worked out really well. Um, we, we've come to realize that there's a lot of creatives that are uh, living in the tension of how do I do this well? How do I hold to my Christian theological distinctives while still main, maintaining uh, a trueness to my creativity and my expressions of art? A lot of people don't know how to do that. And so the Canvas Conference we found was a very helpful way uh, to kind of bridge some of those gaps and to help inform some of those questions. My cousin Kelvin, I remember I was like 12 and he, not the right age to be telling me this, but he showed me like Anthony Green, She Loves Me So, and he was like, this is the song you need to lose your virginity to. And I was like, that's weird. Um, but okay, and uh, and like I listened to that and it just kind of like, you know, introduced me, I guess, to, you know, like, you know, uh, emo music. Anthony Green is like, you know, uh, Seosin and like, you know, Circa. A friend of ours mispronounced the word cherry tomatoes and at the time we had a really bad fucking band name that was somehow worse than Cherry Domingo. And so it was like, that's clearly better. So we just fuck, fuck it. It's Jared and me. I don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't. <laughs> yeah. Maddie, what's your role in the band? I drive. <laughs> I drive. <laughs> um, I do all, all the content, the media yeah. content. She was taking photos for this band, and um, you know we became friends, and then she did. Uh, all the content for Eagles and Anchors, um, all the videos and stuff like that. Um, and then that turned into Cherry. And so then she naturally, like, I guess she, you know, Maddie was awesome enough to like still help us out. I think uh, doing something with three other people, like, um, like you just can't be lazy. Like it's, you know, these guys are relying on you and I'm relying on them. So you really can't be lazy, you know? It's like, we all like kind of feed each other that. Doing Cherry Domingo full time, I mean, that's definitely the dream. We talk about it all the time. Like, you know, it's tough, like, I have to work full time and then I try to put like full time into this as well. So it would be nice to finally just have this be, yeah. you know, do it for a living. Yeah. My days off, we practice. So it's like, every all the time I have goes to music and so. But I don't want a plan B. I don't want this to be forever, so. It's the only thing that I think I'm good at, you know? Um, I, you know, you, it's like I've put so much of myself and time and not just me, but you know, three other people like in into this. I think the fear of having a regular job and knowing like, this is all I'm gonna do. Like, I see a lot of like my family too, like, been at the same job for their whole life. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to break the chain. And it's super hard, but maybe that will make way for the next generation or something. I'll note that a friend, um, a youth minister friend, got in a car with one of the kids in his youth group and the kid was playing something very loud and almost incoherent. Definitely a lot of rage involved in it. It might have been Slipknot or something like that. And um, as soon as they got in the car and the kid realized it was on, he immediately turned it off. My youth minister friend said, what was that? He said, I don't know. I mean, he did what admit what it was, and he acknowledged that, it would, let's say it was Slipknot, I don't know, it was Slipknot. And immediately the young person said, I don't really listen to the lyrics. Um, which isn't true. <laughs> it really isn't true. He said, I don't really listen to the lyrics. But my friend said, well, you should. I mean, if, if you love it, you're going to want to follow up on it. And he was trying to challenge the fella's um, knee-jerk defensiveness. I love this, but I'm sure I shouldn't love it. With a kind of, well, what's the information in the fact that you love it? 
Maybe it does address something that needs to be addressed. And maybe it really is awesome, this thing that you're taking in. As a creative, I've always been drawn to uh, the narrative of Christianity, uh, God creating, and then from there how everything else functions. It's even awkward to try to even label them as separate because when we talk about eschatology and the intention of the church and what the church is in the planet for, what is it meant to do, and it's meant to show the people around what God is like, is to be missionaries in our context and to point people to God and God's nature, His holiness, His justice, His love, His care, um, for people that are not believers to see what God is like through His disciples. And if, if the church is meant to be an institution that showcases God's attributes and who He is and how He is and what He does, then creativity is very much a part of that, that God is a creative being. You cannot be human and not be creative. Church, churches are made of humans and humans possess creativity in them. I became a Christian at the age of 18 and my experience within the church walls was a really complicated experience. I, um, I communicated creatively. I thought kind of out of the box and it seemed like everybody else in the, in the church was much more didactic or uh, just linear. Uh, and so I was misunderstood. Um, I, I, I just really struggled. Uh, there wasn't people who looked like me and acted like me. So I found a lot more um, community in my spaces with non-Christians who were creatives than I actually did in the church. It wasn't until much later in my Christian walk where I had some of these Christian guys approach me uh, who were interested in my creative craft. I was doing shows in Los Angeles, performing in bars and in clubs and stuff. And so some of these dudes would show up at, at some of these shows and they would begin to ask me questions about theology, about church, uh, about discipleship, uh, the inerrancy of scripture. And of course, I just was like, I've never had to wrestle with these questions before. Uh, and that was kind of like my gateway into uh, the, the church where there was a, a sense of invitation and acceptance. And in that context, I realized that uh, there is a unique space for me as a Christian and a creative to not only function in the church and find acceptance in the church, but actually flourish. Uh, so these men began to disciple me uh, and my identity as a Christian uh, began to, uh, to shape and reform in many ways. For whatever reason, I have needed to reconcile my creativity with with my understanding of God, um, because we separated somehow. Um, but I think what, what creatives get wrong often, which is not exclusive to creatives, but it happens to artists a lot and creatives a lot, because for whatever reason, what we do seems to be a lot more connected to us than if I was just someone doing accounting. Art is often an expression of someone. It's always an expression of someone. So there's always a piece of me in what I'm doing. An accountant might not feel that connection as much as an artist would. And so I think it often what ends up happening is that the artist starts to put a lot of equity in their art and start to connect it too intimately with who they are as a person. If you critique my art, you're critiquing me. If you're praising my art, you're praising me. If my art needs work, I need work. 
it's just, it becomes so intimately connected that it's unhealthy. I think the way to engage um, creatives in a healthy way in the context of a local church might at first appear a bit unorthodox, might seem like it's not the right way. And, and that is actually treating the artists like normal people. I mean, the relationship between creativity and the church, I would argue centers predominantly in uh, the God who is the creator. So, so that's, that's the starting point uh, for, for both creativity and for the church. I mean, why do we gather together? Uh, well, we're, as, a, as a church, we, we gather together to worship the Lord. Why are we creative? because we are image bearers of a creative God. So what, what you deal with in the context of uh, creative Christians in the church is um, right now in our culture is uh, a lot of exploitation so that the church sees all of the value uh, that the creative brings to the church because the, the creative makes beautiful things. And so they want them in their church because they feel like if we have them in our church, well, then our church will be cool. Our church will be beautiful. Um, but what the church can actually do is perpetuate um, the, the idea that the artist's only value and only worth is in their art. Uh, and so that actually continues this downward spiral for Christian artists. If you help creatives to come into the church, not taking from them, but giving to them, helping them to shape their identity around um, what it means to be a Christian, then you actually help creatives flourish as a Christian first and foremost which gives them the proper framework to do their art. A theology of creativity, uh, just like we talked about with regard to church and, and the creative starting point, uh, it begins with God, God as creator, God as the one who creates, God that, as the one who creates a world where it, it, it's reflecting his own glory, uh, both in, in sort of a, a natural revelation, but simultaneously also using special revelation to demonstrate that glory and that beauty as well. So, so everything that's happening uh, in his creative work is pushing our eyes and our ears back to hear about who he is and to see, see his beauty in, in many, many ways. As we begin to shift in sin away from worshiping God, to actually worshiping his creation. And, and that's, 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 a, that's a huge theme when it comes to the relationship between theology and creativity. Why do you create in the first place? Is your art all about you or is your art intended to serve uh, the community? Um, once they begin to figure those things out, then they begin to flourish, not only as a Christian, but also as an artist. Uh, instead of being image bearers, we, we are trying to take, we're trying to take the glory that belongs to the Lord. And so that, that's what happens in sin. Sin is that sort of shift from, fr from worshiping the creative God to actually worshiping in an idolatrous way, uh, creative image bearers. And while there is a sense uh, of doing art that you enjoy, your art is not ultimately for you. Your art is ultimately for the glory of God and for the flourishing of, of humans. That can only happen, that, that's what creates healthy artists and that can only happen when the church begins to disciple creatives in a healthy way that is somewhat disconnected from their art, that cares more about their, uh, the whole of the person than just, we wanna use you to make amazing things for the church. David wants to make sure that we're paying attention to the ways we try to separate our religious life from the rest of life. And he wants to strip away those barriers. I asked him, if someone were to say to him, okay, I get it. How do I get better? How do I get to a more integrated way of seeing and a more integrated way of living? So for me, part of getting better on that is to not let a category like secular or any label serve to stand in the way 
of viewing other people in their infinite complexity and their infinite value as bearers of God's image. I resist calling people or any cultural offering secular because I, I believe that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And I believe that every human being is in deep relationship with God, even if that person doesn't believe in God. I like to note with my students that we can have things called worship services. But if we call them worship services and honestly believe that there's a start and stop time on our worship, as in worship service concluded, now I'm just going to go out and live my life. That's a perverse and tragic way of viewing your own heartbeat, your own liturgies, your own work life. And of course, my big word on that is witness, because my witness isn't what I say I believe or what I pretend to believe. It's what I do. It's my entire, it's the sum of my entire output. like a fire that I can feel oh, burning in my soul it's someone brings like just play something cool like the song Wheeze it was someone turning up the uh, volume knob on their guitar back and forth and I was like keep doing that and then me and the drummer looked at each other and we just kept that groove going and then it just like exploded into a song and it happened literally in what five ten minutes we just wrote that whole song the oh. lyrics are based off of 500 days of summer for wheeze for yeah. wheeze, for yeah, wheeze. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah honestly movies are a big like inspirational thing for me like i, I think most of the songs that we write are, have nothing to do with me and, and are about a movie you know well, it's always tricky when you're using language like sacred and secular. And I think that, that the church really wants to clearly define the difference. These people are making things that are not godly or not beautiful. Um, we really wanna hold fast to, you know, uh, the, the Christian world and life view where things are right and good and true and beautiful. And, and I think when we do that, we actually miss out on a whole bunch of things. I think that God is the creator of creativity. And we as image bearers have the, the potential to make amazing and beautiful things, whether you're a Christian or not. The fact that you're an image bearer made in the image of God, who is a creative God, testifies that um, we should all be making creative things, beautiful things. And so there's a strange divide that has happened uh, between the secular and the, and the sacred. And so the secular says creativity and beauty and art is, is over there. The church is saying it's all over there. I would say the cr creative is, is reaching out for sacred things, trying to capture sacred things uh, in a way that's disassociated from the sacred one. You have the church sort of giving up on, on, on beauty and art because they think it's in another category, it's over in the secular, when in reality, that, this is the heartbeat of what it means to be following a, a creative God who establishes goodness, establishes truth, and establishes what is beautiful which is exactly what the artist is after, what we're all after in many ways. And, and I think the church has done a, itself a, a disservice by saying that's theirs. We're gonna just sort of piddle around over here with Xerox copies of what the world does, or we're just gonna put our heads in the sand and not think about those things. The Christian uniquely understands that they were made in the image of God. The world doesn't understand those things. The world is creating with all of the resources that God has given them, they just don't know it. The mind that they use to make art, the, the fingers that they have to, to strum the guitar, the, the, the paintbrush that they use, the colors, the texture, all of that was given to them by God to create, they just don't know it. 
But the Christian uniquely understands that all uh, creativity is derivative. We borrow everything from the God who created everything uh, and so what we can begin to do is make beautiful things that testify of the God of all creation. And Christians uniquely understand uh, the transcendence. Every artist, Christian or non-Christian, desires to make art that transcends the here and the now. They want to make art that is otherworldly, like art that extends far beyond this world. Christians uniquely understand how to do that because we serve a God who is transcendent. Charles Taylor has used, the, the, he's tried to define what the secular age is. And I think it's been really, really helpful because really what ends up happening in the secular age at, at a very basic level is, is, is there, there's, there's a cutting off from what is transcendent. We're, we're pushed into what he calls imminent frames. And so we are just, walking around in a lot of ways with our heads down, not realizing that there's something there's something up. There's something other than what we see, we take in. I mean, that's what the Enlightenment's doing is everything is sense, uh, you know, it's sense perception. That's where truth comes from, uh, or it's all internal, uh, th those kind of things. And and I think, I think recognizing that as, as a sort of a secular paradigm, sort of a cutting off from what is transcendent, or maybe to use uh, C.S. Lewis's language, that which is enchanted. Um, I, I think that's, that's helpful to diagnose. What I wanna say is, yes, that's there, but uh, maybe there's a trap door in it. I mean, we, we can break that open. When we think about God, we, ex we instantaneously know God is other than, God is far beyond us. And so if Christians would just simply uh, make beautiful things that testify of the beautiful God who is transcendent, I think we could actually use our creativity as a means to evangelize to the culture who is looking for uh, transcendence. They're looking for it, they're longing for it. That's one of the reasons why they're making art to begin with. And for the Christian, I think as David Dark's talking about, a Christian can understand the world and understand what the world is worshiping. So instead of seeing it as, okay, I'm going to take all these things and either throw them away, or I'm gonna live in two different camps in my life. And so I oftentimes get really frustrated with this whole sacred and secular divide. I would say, let's just make amazing things and use it as a means to engage these artists who are making amazing and beautiful things, but help to show them there is far more beyond why you're making what you're making or who you're making your art for. Uh, the moment we begin to think like that, the more we can be a, a better witness to culture. People say it's very hard to be mad at someone who's sitting across from you sharing a meal. And I think when, when it comes to hospitality and even using hospitality as a creative way to engage with our neighbor, whether they're creative or not, um, but let's say they are creative, and as a way to have a conversation about um, what moves me to create art and what moves them to create art. and just to have a dialogue of what our motivations are in order to just have a fun conversation and we can connect with them. Uh, and even as a way to pique their interest for what motivates me to create art if it's coming from a theological worldview. Well, when you look at the life of Jesus, one of Jesus's profound qualities was hospitality, love, and compassion for lost people. Jesus establishes for Christians the blueprint for how to engage culture. I think the baseline of hospitality is uh, that, that we're all human, uh, that we're all sinful, and that we're all needy, 
and that we all need one another. God has created us for all those things. So Jesus practices hospitality. He eats with uh, sinners and tax collectors. He um, establishes a sense of community with people who are all over the, the map. Uh, fishermen, uh, tax collectors, uh, theologians. He, he, he engages this world and he creates this community where he models what it looks like to be a Christian by doing life with, with these dudes. So you look at um, Jesus at Levi, the tax collector's house party. Levi is confronted uh, by Jesus. Jesus extends value and dignity to this tax collector and, and commissions him and, and calls him, summons him really, come, follow me, come, come with me. So you approach people through hospitality, not just to win them, uh, not just to um, have some sort of gospel victory over them, but you approach them as uh, people just like us. Yeah. And so you're looking to serve them and in an interesting way, them to serve you as well. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you, you water down and you transition who you are to fit their cultural paradigm. What you're doing is you're inviting them in to your space, you're inviting them into who you are uh, and you just unapologetically be who you are. And simultaneously, you let those people unapologetically be who they are. Levi, the tax collector's response is what? Hospitality. Let's throw a house party. Let's throw a house party where I can invite all my homies to come and kick it. Like I, I'm, I'm doing life with, the, with all these dudes who need to understand what forgiveness looks like. Let's throw a party, invite Jesus as the guest of honor and let Jesus chop it up with all these people. That is the perfect picture of what we as Christians should be doing. We experience forgiveness from Jesus. We experience uh, the life-giving words of Jesus. And what we should do is practice hospitality, throw house parties, invite all of our non-believing friends to come into this space, break bread, eat, and just love them. That's hospitality. That is, that is the quintessential expression of hospitality playing shows where we've had people like sing the words and like I've never had that in like any band I've ever been in. So, I mean, that definitely also helps push us to keep going because we think we're doing something right, so. There's so much um, motivation in that, like just that, you know? Um, playing a solo show and like people singing and like dancing and like, um, like that's, I mean, that's so much motivation right there, you know? Playing your guys' show. You don't have to say that. Uh, no, I swear to God. <laughs> that was that. Because I remember when we rolled up to the show, we knew no one. And I, in my head, I didn't say anything to us. I was like, I don't know if these guys are going to, these kids are going to like us. And it was like the first time we were outside of people not knowing who we were. Never heard any of the songs. And we just said, let's just play and give it our all. And the reaction was so like, we could do it. That was my first time like we could do something like that, you know? So that was awesome. So as a humble beast, we're not trying to necessarily manipulate that community. We just want to offer a place where that community can take place and truth can be spoken into it and other positions can be heard and listened to and engaged, uh, but also unapologetically being Christian in the way we approach our art, uh, the way we approach our, our work, the way we think about the world, uh, and speaking that into, um, in, into the world. And anyone who will listen, anyone who will come to the door, anyone will, that will you know, turn on Spotify to, to some of the stuff we've created, those kind of things. The older I get, the more aware of how little time I have left. And the, the, the older I get, the more I desire to help creatives to live a healthy Christian life. I wanna help them think about the gifts that God has uniquely given them 
to not only glorify God with those gifts, but to help serve the church. I want to I want to bridge that gap. If art, your art, your art is about you, you must revisit your affections because the whole purpose is worship. It's older than you. It's not at all you. <laughs> it's for someone else. And, and that's where, that's, I think what, that's one of the things that artists can get wrong in their relationship to the church is that it is hard for them to worship through what they do um, because it's very hard for them to detach themselves from what they do. They're so deeply embedded in their, uh, in their art that their identity is so connected to it. You are not first and foremost an artist. You are first and foremost a child of God. And that, that happens by helping them to understand the gospel. They do not have to perform to find peace with God. In all other aspects of their life, they are performing to gain acceptance, approval, and worth. In every other area, they do a show, they're performing to find value and self-worth. Their Instagram, they're telling stories looking for val validation and dignity and worth. In all other aspects of life, they're performing. The gospel is the only thing that comes to them and says, you don't have to perform to receive from God. If you embrace Jesus by faith, if you accept Jesus on his terms, if you believe that he is who he says he is, the son of God who came to die for your sins, to take on the debt that you deserve for your sins, if you trust in that, you can have him as a free gift. You don't have to perform. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to be right enough. You don't have to say the right things or act a certain way. You just trust and believe. That is the gospel. It's the only thing that doesn't require for you to perform. That's why I think if you help artists to understand the gospel, they will be the biggest uh, evangelists uh, for Jesus because that frees them. That's the first time where the, the artist can actually say, oh man, I, I feel freedom here. I don't have to be a particular way or perform a certain way. I don't have to live up to everybody's expectations. I could just embrace Jesus and receive this free gift. That is what causes creatives to flourish. The gospel is the only thing that does that for creatives. It's liberating when you think about it. The gospel is the peace that, that uh, removes the shackles of the artist's desperate need to find validation and affirmation from the world. They find it uniquely in the person and work of Jesus. So liturgy as the work of the people has been really helpful to me in doing this thing that I'm always trying to do, which is erase that line in which we wanna say this over here is my worship, this is my faith, this is my personal private relationship with Jesus. And this over here is just what we have to do in the name of national security. <laughs> or this over here is business, sorry, not personal business. I understand these divisions. I use them myself sometimes, but they are unworthy of an undivided life.
again in Christ forgiven Righteousness and eternal life when salvation is given All my sins paid for and I could never repay you But now my greatest delight is to trust you and obey you More than a genre of music, worship is a heart change I gladly bow my knee to the God who never changes Every day I'm changing, becoming more like Christ Adoring what is good, adorned with the fruits of new life And my hope is not a fantasy, it's built upon a reality That you will keep your promises according to your sovereignty I will see your face and be safe under your reign When my faith turns to sight and only perfect love remains Your people are my people, no matter where they come from The church exists according to the works of God's Son So in the new creation, when we're gathered in His name It will be obvious that He's the one who's worthy of all fame Because the worthiness of Jesus is the reason we belong So worthy is the Lamb will forever be our song Distance between the depths of your worthiness and mine Mine is derivative, all my worth comes from thine I am merely a man, all thy works divine I abide only as a branch attached to the vine That grows the beautiful fruit that gets crushed into wine I am the least deserving, made worthy to touch his feet A servant that did nothing to earn a seat at the wedding feast I'm a created being, you created everything You make footstools of fools and galaxies your rings You are Christ the consummate, my hope and every confidence Worthy to receive praise from every mouth and every continent infinitely worthy of loyalty in my allegiance